is the voice we're hearing. We need freedom, freedom, freedom. How much longer till we sing a new song? Blessed are those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. It's hard to feel merciful sometimes, isn't it, to those who've oppressed you? Yes, it is. And we're talking about this in light of the public execution of George Floyd, which we all saw. Um, and I would say, if we looked at that verse, what if we turned it around and we said, cursed are those who do not show mercy, for they will be shown no mercy. If we think about Derek Chavon, the police officer who killed George Floyd on the streets of Minneapolis after he allegedly used the counterfeit $20 bill to buy cigarettes. This in the context of losing his job as a result of COVID-19 and the subsequent hardship. So what does forgiveness and showing mercy mean in this context? You know, I think we've got to think about justice. I think that we've got to think about what does forgiveness mean in terms of black men being more likely to be stopped and searched, Asian people and black people more likely to be poor, black and Asian people three times more likely to die from COVID, and Martin Luther King said that forgiveness doesn't mean ignoring what has been done. Not that we go around with hatred all the time because that's not going to get us anywhere. But I do think that we have to protest. I do think that we have to say enough is enough. I do think that we have to say, no, it's not good enough for someone to put their, their knee on the neck of a man for nearly nine minutes where he's shouting out, I can't breathe, where a grown man is shouting for his, his mother and saying, this is not good enough. We'll get to a stage of forgiveness, perhaps, whatever that means within that context, but we've got to root out the injustice in society first. So you're saying, that if the white man can become merciful, then they will receive mercy. I believe so, yes, because the white man in this context has the power. The white man was in a position to show mercy to George Floyd. He chose not to do so. I mean, what does forgiveness mean? Does, so, does forgiveness mean, you know, that the family, all the black victims of injustice say, oh, oh, that's okay. We love Jesus, we're going to forgive him, and life carries on as normal? That's not right. Forgiveness, I think, is part of a bigger picture where we're looking at a new start. We've got to root the evil act out of the relationship. Once that's done, then, then, we, can, then we can look at a fresh start, then we can look at a new beginning. Desmond Tutu, of course, who is an extraordinary icon of forgiveness isn't he he says that the problem with unforgiveness is that in the end you poison yourself he says it's like i felt for a long time he's talking about himself i was in the prison of unforgiveness mm. until i was able to turn the key walk out and become a free man i think it is right to find it in our hearts to forgive when the time is right to do so. And, you know, even if we think about South Africa, they had to go through truth and reconciliation. So first of all, there has to be truth. Once we have truth, then we come to reconciliation. Forgiveness is hard. Forgiveness is a process. When white people hear the pain that black people have endured and imbibe that into their system, feel that pain themselves, then, you know, we can come to a place of reconciliation. And that's where forgiveness takes place. So it's hard, it's difficult, it's going to take a long time. 
Over the last uh, week, we've witnessed um, increasingly around the country and in America, the artifacts of slavery and racism being torn down, statues destroyed, thrown into rivers, removed, etc. Do you think that that helps the process or is that irrelevant to the process? Oh, it's certainly not irrelevant. It's certainly not irrelevant. I mean, these are really complex issues and I think they're often framed as quite binary. It's either political correctness gone mad on one side or the mob trying to erase Western civilization. And I think they're very, these are very, very complex issues. Um, but I think we've got to recognize that this is all part of history. These statues are all part of history. And, and the realization that this history for some is brutalizing and for others is heroic, but we've got to tell the whole story. So is it helpful to lose Colston down the river? I think that it's better to put him in a museum where you can tell the whole story. But the whole story is that Britain has an imperial past. Violence, crimes, atrocities, you know, murder. So Chin Chin Chinamanda Ngozi Adichie talks about the, the dangers of the single story. We need to see stories from several different perspectives, several different lenses. And we know that within our culture, you know, statues are cultural symbols of powerful significance. Um, and they've become a site of struggle. And we've got to understand where that comes from. You know, this is about representation, who and what we want to be represented in our visual landscape. And of course, society is changing. And I'm, I'm pleased to see that people are say, some people are saying that these people are not representative of our values now and they need to be put elsewhere and you know maybe we need other icons in the public square that are representative of where society is at now i don't think that they should be um uh, destroyed and erased because that's an erasure of history and the history is important but at every Mem remembrance day i hear those words lest we forget we don't want to forget this no do we? no and yeah you're right those those symbols those icons within the correct context though i would argue because having them were on the visual landscape holds them up as um icons of victory and triumph and that isn't the whole story so i think within a museum um you know within galleries um, within spaces where we can discuss both sides of the story. I think that's where we need them. And we use them as a tool to educate ourselves and to educate our youngsters as well. Because you're right, we mustn't forget. A city like Bristol, of course, which I know well, the whole thing is built on the slave trade. So there has to come a point at which you come to terms with your history the naming of your towns and cities and its roadways etc but find a way of allowing it to act as a reminder of where you've come from rather than where you're going yeah no absolutely i think that within the uk context and um, there hasn't been an acknowledgement of that history that whole imperial history needs to be brought much more to the for forefront it needs to be part of the curriculum it needs to be taught in schools so white kids black kids understand it and they see where it fits in terms of the development of this nation some people say that white people should stay out of this and some people say black people can't fix a problem that they didn't create in the first place. Yeah. So what's the role of white people in this present debate and crisis? Well, it's a struggle for justice. And I think all people everywhere, regardless of their colour, needs to be engaged in the fight for justice. Black people can't fight this fight on their own. You know, we live in a white supremacist system and people get very worried and frightened by when we, you know, use the words white supremacy. But white supremacy is a system that enables white people to benefit. So white people are the beneficiaries of that system, 
and it's an unjust system. So if we're going to take that system down, white people need to become allies within the struggle. White silence is violence. When white people stand by and say nothing or say it's got nothing to do with me, it's violence. It's the same as that white policeman putting his knee on George Floyd's neck. It's violence. White people need to, to stand. And, and, and they also need to live with the discomfort. Talking about issues of race is uncomfortable. Talking about the brutality, talking about institutional racism, talking about microaggressions, it's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable for white people. It's uncomfortable for black people. And we need to live with that discomfort. If white people have the influence, they need to use their influence in, in their places of work, you know, on the street corners, wherever they are, to advocate and to stand with black people, but more importantly, to stand against injustice. I don't want to live in a society, I don't want my children and my grandchildren to live in a society where black people are routinely dying in um, police custody, where there's um, inequality in the education system, where there's inequality in employment systems, where there's inequality in health. So together, we've all got to strive for a better society, because if it's a better society for, for, um, for me, it will be a better society for my white brothers and sisters. We want to live in a society where we can all breathe. We all need to be able to breathe. Blessed are those who work to create a merciful society, for they will inherit it. Amen.